Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Um, I know it's getting to be a busier time of the academic year. And so I appreciate y'all um, being here to learn and about how to um, challenge historic research norms that we may not want to perpetuate anymore. Uh, Cause that's what we're gonna talk about today. So the topic for today is thinking about um, how to restructure the norms of research. Um, and so what that's gonna look like is, first I'll start us off with some foundational concepts as always. Um, I will talk about how unpacking like what makes the norm of research, um, thinking about how that norm um, functions based on the simultaneous sort of like alienation and erasure of the quote unquote other, um, what we can do to kind of reposition the center or strategies to um, face these challenges, some discussion questions, and closing. The foundational concepts I really want us to think about today, the, the most fundamental of them is the concept of a norm or, um, you know, what is, what is normal. Uh, there's often power dynamics underneath whatever we can, is considered the norm or the normal in any particular situation. Um, and we're going to think on the, like, the who and the what um, is that norm. And surprise, surprise, um, what the norm has to do with has a lot to do with gender and race, and as well as just a broader sense of um, intersectionality. And what norms do is they kind of erase all that. They make it as if it's genderless, raceless. Um, there's no sort of position from which the norm is created, but that's, that's all a myth. That's not true. There's always a place from which the norm is coming. So, um, so kind of like questions I just want you to reflect on as I talk about it um, and that we'll be exploring is what is the historic normal upon which assumptions will rest? And how have you been taught to study race and gender, if at all? And chances are, if you have been taught to study race and gender, it sort of is like in opposition. So it's like we study like women, we study health and we study women's health. Um, we study history and then we study like the history uh, from of African Americans when those those things shouldn't be separate. It's like you shouldn't have to market the fact that you have to market is um, is part of the problem, and that's kind of what you know what we're thinking about today. So you know some questions you can think about is one like if you're in engineering or tech making tech, you can think who's the user, who is the implicit user. Um, if you're doing research, you can think about like oh, the scientist, who is the observer. So any, every, almost every field has like, who is the implicit observer? Who is the subject of research? What is the perspective from which things are, the assumptions are implicitly coming? What is the purpose of the research? Um, so who, what is the future use or outcome? Who does this use or outcome benefit? Whose priorities are best being served? Whose perspective dominates? These are all questions upon which the idea of norm um, is really important. Thinking about one way I want to encourage you to think about today's lesson in relationship to um, last week when we talked about making a plan um, for action is kind of like what we're talking today are the challenges under the challenges. Like last week in your discussions, you talked a lot about your visions. Now, um, this week, you'll be thinking about the relationship of your visions and the challenges. Like, how do we get from there to here to there? We have to be aware of challenges. Um, these are kind of like the big picture challenges. And the ones I'll be talking about today, um, there's more than these, but this kind of hits a lot of big ones, is the whiteness of science, masculinity as a default, um, the foundation of science and colonialism, um, I'll mention language imperialism, and the erasure of the quote other. So to start out, um, I want us to think about the whiteness of science. Um, I have here a quote by George Lipsitz, who wrote this really great essay called The Possessive Investment in Whiteness, Racialized Social Democracy and the White Problem in American Studies. That's a specific field, but there's a lot of stuff in it that's relevant to, um, just relevant in general to understanding how whiteness operates in our culture. And so whiteness is very much a norm of US culture in general, but more spe most specifically of science as well. Um, there is just this idea that whiteness is a norm against which other things are studied or you know against even like the norms of a profession. So I think that's one um, example to think about. 
is how is you know whiteness a sort of implicit norm in research? So um, when we think about masculinity, as old, masculinity is another default in science. Um, it's part of the norms of how um, one proceeds in science, a sort of like dominance of a competitive culture that is a traditionally masculinized mode of movement. Uh, it's normalized in just the language of sort of like adventure, um, more on that in a moment when we get to colonialism. It's also um, a norm in, in terms of whom the presumed subject is and who benefits. And so again, if we come back to examples of health, um, oftentimes the presumed norm of, of, of health science research is a white male subject. Um, and they're the ones who are sort of set up to best benefit. Um, there's numerous examples of this. Um, you could just take the example of, you know, how, um, how much research we, and how much research has been done on, um, you know, on male sexual dysfunction versus, um, you know, female sort of sexual challenges. Like it's really disproportionately weighed there. Um, and there's a lot of gendered norms that obviously play into that as well. So we have, White, whiteness, masculinity, and the third, um, it, a third is foundations, the foundations of science in colonialism. Um, here we have a quote um, that says, in the coming century, the study of imperialism will depend largely upon the success of the microscope. This, I think, is a really interesting quote because um, what they're talking about is the relationship between what's possible to study with the microscope and tropical diseases. Um, because as um, this is, you know, the British specifically, the, the supply to many other colonial powers, um, as, as the British um, colonial uh, um, sort of imperialists were moving into, say, um, countries that had high rates of malaria, they needed to, and as well as other tropical diseases, they were relying on the microscope to help them to find solutions. And so, um, Basically, what Sir Ronald Ross here is saying is that, you know, for us to actually, for, for the Brit British to actually be successful in its practice of imperialism, they really need science to help all those British colonizers from not dying of malaria. You'll notice that the, the, the goal was not to say, um, I mean, this would still be a, have some challenges, but say it wasn't to help those um, indigenous to the area to say, okay, here, we're gonna help you deal with this disease. Um, it wasn't even necessarily to look at the solutions that maybe local populations had to deal with some of these tropical diseases. It was just to say, you know, okay, science is gonna be our tool, a tool for colonialism. And there's many, many other ways that this was also the case. This is just one I wanted to highlight. Um, oh, before I get to this, I also wanna highlight, um, I, I mentioned imperialism of language. And this, this is a really great one that I appreciate. Um, one of the facilitators pointed out um, is within science, we also see um, a sort of um, imperialism around the English as the like lingua franca. Um, English is the language in which um, one sort of um, must publish if they really want to be seen and recognized and have higher citations to have their work be of influence. So. Um, that's something else to think about. Um, it's something that some are challenging. You know, obviously there's really amazing innovative findings happening in by scholars um, in a, and being printed in other languages, but those don't make their way into scientific discourse as readily as those that are published in English. And it also sets up a really, um, a possi the possibility of research sort of being like taken and scooped and appropriated um, by those who are at larger institutions and can sort of are more well positioned to capitalize on innovative findings than somebody at a smaller institution from a less resourced country that may not be English speaking. So all those things are issues. Um, and, you know, one of the other ways that this sort of norm um, norm shows itself is also through the erasure of what is like not the normal. So we see one um, innovators are be, innovators who are not sort of say will fall within the white male category are erased, downplayed or appropriated. We see this in the way that um, indigenous people's contributions to the explosion of discovery that ha discovery that happened during colonialism was essentially ignored. It's as if you know the European settlers just sort of came in and they 
did all these things on their own, when actually no, that's not true. They were really relying very heavily on indigenous knowledges. Um, these, and we also see the, the contributions of, um, of black people are often ignored in the history of science and technology as are women's contributions. A great recent pop example um, we saw in the movie Hidden Figures where we learned about the, um, or most people learned about the contributions of um, black women computers um, who were computating all of the um, trajectories necessary for a successful NASA space flight. Uh, so one, we see their contributions or the contributions of the quote unquote other are downplayed. Um, two, the benefits are also gendered and racialized. And so uh, who, it, who is going to receive the benefits? So say um, there's a great book by Ruha Benjamin that looks at how um, many within the black community were resistant to um, paying using taxpayer money to fund stem cell research in California because they argued why should we support these cutting edge innovations when we can't even get the most basic health care. Um, and finally another way that there is this sort of like you know more um, uh, more the other is, is made highly visible because um, that's what's really really strange about this is the other is simultaneously erased and made highly visible. Um, the other is made highly visible through pathologizing the idea that whatever is wrong um, is often gendered and racialized. So whatever just whatever may um, so a great example is just uh, menstruation. Menstruation is seen as is is, is it in many ways in medicine has historically been sort of seen as pathology. Um, the way that we even th we think about disability is another example. The um, categorization of pregnancy as a disability is another is um, kind of highlights that intersection even more. We also see the ways that it's racialized. So say certain customs within a racialized culture may be more likely to be seen as deficient or somehow um, not, not normal, whereas whatever white culture does is seen as the norm. So what are some strategies that we can take? So that was kind of like we saw a whole bunch of challenges and it's like, wow, that's a lot. You know, what are we supposed to do about this? Well, here's some strategies that we can use that you all could think about as you think about moving from your vision through the challenges to a plan. Um, one strategy is to resurrect the bur buried histories. Another is to reframe narratives. So in other words, think about how you can retell the stories. Um, really crucial strategy is changing power dynamics. Um, I'll say more about that in a moment. And finally, um, an example, and, and just a way of kind of, as an example, I'll talk about the difference between risk assessment versus um, alternative assessment. Um, so I'll kind of go through these now. So first, thinking, um, there's lots of wonderful examples of reviving these sort of like um, hidden or obscured histories. Uh, Rayvon Fouché wrote a really wonderful book about Black inventors in the age of segregation, where you can read about the um, really amazing um, technological feats of different Black inventors. Uh, Alondra Nelson wrote a fantastic book called Body and Soul, the Black Panther Party, Party and the Fight Against Medical Discrimination that really shows how the Black Panther Party was really crucial to the innovations within public health. and um, rethinking its boundaries, rethinking um, how to give good medical care to a group of people that were systemically being denied that or explicitly be, being given bad, um, poor, poor care within the US systems. So um, that's examples of you know, reviving hidden histories. The next thing we can think about, we can look at is um, ways of changing power dynamics and changing the narrative. So. One narrative that we often see with um, historically um, underserved, historically under-resourced and um, oppressed communities is a cycle of victim blaming and coercion. And, and so sort of like um, they'll say there's somehow it sort of is like people who've been subject to oppression, somehow it's their fault. And um, the fact that they don't want to take to be in collaboration with their oppressors um, is what part of what keeps them stuck. 
And so I'll kind of talk through an example of this so it's a little, little more clear. So this is an example from genomics research. So uh, many indigenous communities and people are really reluctant to engage um, with genomics research at this time because of, you know, both because of research harms, both in the in in the past and in the not so recent past, or not so very the very recent past. And so they're saying, well, you know, there's an interest within the genetics community to um, obtain genetic information from indigenous populations um, to diversify the store of human DNA that we have and the potential for medical innovations that can be um, that can be realized, which sounds great. But indigenous, many indigenous communities, communities are saying, why should I give this to you? Um, because, you know, you've, you're, again, we're not getting access to the most basic resources. We know you're taking our DNA. We know you're, you're you know, creating innovations that are making you a lot of money and we're not seeing anything. Like, why, why should we do this? Um, and the, in the cycle of victim blaming and co coercion, their disengagement leads researchers to tell them that tell indigenous people that they will miss out on the benefits of precision health research if they don't engage, um, but they're not necessarily willing to change any of the power imbalances or address the research harms. And so any publicly funded research such a search agenda with a clear path to commercialization, but without a clear path for indigenous health or economy is fundamentally flawed. So instead, many indigenous communities are starting to conceptualize of samples and data in terms of gift giving. Um, they consider um, they're considering cons they they think of it in terms of stewardship. So indigenous derived samples and data can be accepted for research are still consent con considered continued property of the donor or the DNA. Like the DNA is like um, to put it another way, the DNA is on loan. And so this is, I think, a really interesting project. There's some really amazing um, labs that are being started up right now, looking at indigenous genomics that are actively, um, in, like, actively enacting this possibility in the world. This is something that was sort of like, um, you know, more of an idea not that long ago, and now is becoming a reality. There's some really interesting tensions between um, this model and uh, the model of open data, which is becoming increasingly popular within science as a way to democratize knowledge, which in general sounds great. Um, but what's really important is that co like context is extremely important. And in these open data initiatives, sometimes the context can be lost. And nowhere is that more important than in indigenous knowledges. Oh, and the last example I wanted to talk about was um, risk assessment. So as many of us know, we have um, in the US, we have standards for say how much of um, a particular chemical can be in the water or um, certain, certain chemicals that we know to be harmful to human health. Um, and what essentially the way the research is done right now is like, what's the most that we can put in there before it's causing too much harm? And so it sort of is more about that finding the thresholds for how much can we let um, corporations pollute, for example, and with the idea that then many corporations will pollute up to that level, but theoretically not beyond. Now, that's a really um, limited research framing. That's a limited narrative from which to work. What would happen if instead we thought of um, alternative um, that maybe say, okay, well, we know this chemical is not good for us at all. So what other alternatives can we find that just completely um, eliminate that potential, that harmful chemical from our ecosystems? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about it, but that's the whole point is like, we need to be working the specificity and think about what the alternatives are. So I've given you all a general overview of some really large um, challenges to much of our visionary research, specifically the historic norms and status quo of, of which our field meant much of the research in our fields rests. So I want you to think about in your discussion groups. First, what are the historic norms or the status quo upon which work on your field relies and how are they still present? And two, Think about who is erased or positioned as the other in your 
in your field's norms. And once you have a sense of that, then you can think about your, we also want you to think about your vision. What are the historic norms and what historic norms are challenges that stand between you and your vision? And how can your plan engage in strategies that reposition problematic norms? Now, this isn't to say that your plan is gonna, you know, take on white supremacy, but what it, cause that's, that's a really, that's a really big project and you can be a part of that, but your part might just be um, imagining different ways of moving that don't reinforce white supremacy, that do something else. Um, every day that we are finding practices that move against colonialism, that move against patriarchy, that move against white supremacy, and not just move against them, but actively do something different, um, we are um, doing something revolutionary. We are doing something incredibly important. It may feel so, so tiny, but um, that's where we start. Um, because if we can't, we have to be able to imagine it, we have to be able to enact it in some way, shape or form, if we're ever going to reach, you know, the bigger visions and goals that we have. With that, I want to leave you with these closing thoughts. Um, one, to remember that the histories of white supremacy, patriarchy and colonialism have shaped the norms of research today. And two, most, this is really important, I think. Um, most fields are biased by erasure and towards further erasure. In other words, if nothing is done, um, continued erasure will con re erasure will continue to happen. And it takes it, therefore, it takes an active effort to undo this. We can't just sort of say, okay, we're not going to do that anymore and it'll be fine. No, it's like this, this is this isn't a passive thing. Um, and one way in which this is an active thing is to is to challenge ourselves to do research centered on finding alternatives to risk mitigation and that center those historically marginalized. So how can we do research that is centering those that have been historically excluded that have been historically considered the other. I want to thank you all for being here today. Next session we'll talk uh, more about another specific strategy for sort of challenging the norms of research culture, which is valuing community expertise in research, because we know that historically, um, like the scientists, the academics are the real knowledge make makers and the people on the grounds are just the subjects, but there's ways that we can do research that challenge that and actually brings the community really truly into the knowledge creation process as true collaborators. And that's what we'll be talking about next week. Um, so thank you. And I hope you all have wonderful discussions.